to unravel the mystery of Christ from all the interpretations put upon it is quite a difficult task. So we're up against all kinds of misunderstanding of the mystery. Most people believe that it's secular history. That the story is something to do with some historical occasion. And it isn't. It's salvation history. The whole thing is taking place in you, the individual. It's not taking place on the outside at all. But how to convince men that this is true? Well, tonight we will try. I'll try to explain what I know from my own experience. The story is told of Christ, and the term called Son of Man is the term used most to describe the Christ, the Messiah. We are told in the book of Daniel, and one like a son of man came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And he was given dominion and glory and kingdom. Well, dominion means complete control of all human and non-human forces. Complete control. That's dominion. Glory is God himself, as told us in the book of Exodus. I'll make my glory pass before you. And when I pass by, so he equates glory with I. So here it is God himself. And now kingdom is simply the realm where a monarchical ruler dominates all things. The king. In the New Testament, it is said of him, which is a central figure, that he is the Son of Man. So he asked this question. Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they answered, well, some say John the Baptist come again, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, and still others one of the prophets. Then he turned to them and said, But who do you say that I am? So he equates himself with the Son of Man. Then Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He accepts that definition. So here we find the Son of Man, the I, and then Christ, all equal. They are one and the same. So here tonight we speak of this in you. And when the Son of Man, as we are told in the third of John, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now we've just seen that the Son of Man is the I of man, the pronoun I. It means I or it means one. So here we can say, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must I be lifted up, or so must one be lifted up. I'm not speaking of anything outside of you. That I is the one spoken of in Scripture. You must be lifted up. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. This is the drama of Scripture. 
Today the world, I hear it on TV, I read it in the papers, and these very prominent and very popular teachers from the pulpit and from the TV screen are speaking of the signs, and they tell you that we can see the signs of the end of the world. There aren't any signs. You're told in Scripture that of that day and hour, no one knows but the Father. It is not for you to be given the time or the sign. When the sign comes, you'll understand it. Everything will happen in you just as described in the story of Christ. But earthquakes and convulsions of nature, cosmic catastrophes, has nothing to do with the end. This is a unique story all about you. Has nothing to do with the end of the world. It's the end of your journey through the tribulation of human experience. When you pass through the entire tribulation of human experience, that's the end. Then comes the shocking sadness, the I awakening in you. And it's not another, it is you. You are the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the Lord God Jehovah. You are the central figure of Scripture. It has not a thing to do with another. So, catastrophe, well a year ago in San Francisco, I read in the New York Times, that every 24 hours, we have approximately 1,800 what is called natural catastrophes in the world, like volcanoes, earthquakes, storms, typhoons, all kinds of horrible things, but every 24 hours, there are at least 1,800 of these normal natural convulsions of nature. And yet here are our religious leaders interpreting an earthquake, interpreting some convulsion of a war, and you're told there are wars and rumors of wars, but that is not it. If anyone should ever come to you saying, look, here is the Christ, or there is the Christ, believe him not. There is no outside Christ. Christ is buried in you. And when he comes, he can only come by awakening in you. Even though one has actually had him completely awake within himself, don't believe he is the Christ. He has awakened in me the speaker. But I am not the Christ that you're looking for. The Christ that you're looking for is now, now buried in you and must awaken in you as you. It's the I of you. The personal pronoun I, that is Christ. But man doesn't know it, and he's looking on the outside for Christ. And there is no other Christ. So when anyone who tells you because of an enormous following that he can interpret the signs, there aren't any signs on the outside. Let me show you one simple little story. In the 13th chapter of Mark, and the 24th chapter of Matthew, it is said that he turned after having heard from his disciples. They said, look at these buildings, speaking of the temple. Aren't they wonderful? Meaning that they are forever. And he said, you see these buildings? I tell you, not one stone will be left standing upon another, but what it will be thrown down. Not one stone, all will be thrown down. Then they ask, when will it be? Now this is called the little apocalypse in scripture. Brother, these are words of the evangelist, or words of the central figure, but they're all words of the evangelist anyway. They're only relating their own experience. These buildings are not on the outside. So when Blake says, cities 
mountains, valleys, all are human. He meant it. In your own wonderful imagination, these structures are erected. These are the beliefs by which you live. And they're powerful in your mind. The day will come, you will see it, they will seem to be, to you, external to yourself, and they are structures, they are buildings. In my own case, on the 21st day of December, 1960, I saw this city. Though not enormous buildings like the Empire State, say 12, 15, 16 story buildings, but they seem to be everlasting. At that very moment, I knew every one is going to fall. And here came the first one. It all crumbled before my eyes. I knew the next one. It crumbled. I knew the next one. It crumbled. Everything crumbled. Because prior to that day, which is the 21st day of December 1960, I had had the experience of the birth from above and the discovery of the fatherhood of God and the Son of God who actually called me Father, revealing who the Father really is. I had the experience of that ascent of the Son of Man. Then all of my previous beliefs by which I lived, they all collapsed. I too believe, as the whole vast world of Christendom, believe in the historicity of Christ, in the secular history of Christ, and suddenly the whole thing was not there at all. It's all about me. It is all about you. And when I rose from within myself, then all that I formerly believed in had to collapse. These are the structures spoken of. He is not speaking of these buildings falling. If the whole vast city tonight, tonight, move into the Pacific, it is not the end. The end comes to the individual. It doesn't come to us collectively, it comes to us individually. And all the things that you throughout the centuries have erected within you by which you live and believe. When it actually happens in you and you realize you are the central being of Scripture, you are the God spoken of, you are the Christ Jesus spoken of, for well, all the things on the outside that you turn to for comfort, they collapse. But they are now projected within you as buildings. So you see these buildings? Not one stone will be left standing upon another. Not one. It should all come down. Then it happens within you. Now we are told, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Well, we just heard the Son of Man is the Eye of Man. The personal pronoun I. So it's not something on the outside you are lifted up just in the same manner that Moses in the wilderness lifted up the serpent. And that is true. You actually find yourself, now we'll take the story, he was standing on the Mount of Olives, as you read it in the 13th of Mark and the 24th of Matthew. Now we go back to the 14th chapter of Zechariah. Zechariah means Jehovah remembered. This is the last chapter of Zechariah. And he was standing on the Mount of Olives. And this expression, Mount of Olives, is only used twice in the Old Testament. Here is the Mount of Olives. It is used first in 2 Samuel concerning David. But here is the second use of it in almost the end of the Old Testament, the 14th chapter of Zechariah. Remember, the word means Jehovah remembered. This is his place, his covenant. Now the Lord is standing upon the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives was split from east to west, forming a very wide valley. And one half of the month moved northward, and one half moved south. And then 
came out of Jerusalem for the Mount of Olives faced Jerusalem came living water came living water now I tell you the Mount is yourself everything about the story is all within you on the morning of the 8th of April 1960 suddenly I am split from east to west meaning my body from the top of my skull to the base of my spine and it parted about six inches a vast valley between the two sections of my body at the base which would be the spine is a pool of living golden light, living water. Then I looked at it, and I could say with Blake, I knew it was myself. I am looking at it, and I not only knew it was myself, I knew it was my own creator and redeemer, and I am my own creator and redeemer. I fused with it, and then, like a fiery serpent, I went up into my skull. That's heaven. For the kingdom of heaven is within you. That's where the kingdom is. It's all within you. And when I entered, I made every attempt. I can't tell you the force I used to get through my skull. But I couldn't get through my skull. For that is reality. It's within. You don't get out of it. The whole thing takes place within. The best I can use on earth to illustrate it would be a rivet. Have you ever seen someone take a hot, hot rivet and throw it to the one who catches it and then takes it and actually puts it into the steel to make it secure? It's a fascinating sight to see them rivet these steel structures. Well, I actually felt myself being moved right into it. If I could just describe it, it's right here. A little left of the straight line down my forehead, just a tiny fraction left of this area. That's where I felt myself riveted. I made every effort to penetrate and go through, but I couldn't. I was stuck right there. So you're told in Scripture, the 11th chapter of Matthew, and the kingdom of heaven is taken by violence. And the violence take it by force. That's how you take the kingdom. The whole kingdom is in your star. The whole thing is being constructed in your own wonderful human star. So here I am talking only about you. I am not talking about any convulsion of nature. Let them have all their so-called enormous crowds telling people how they can read the signs. We are the end of the world. End of what world? This is a unique reconstruction of the temple of God. And it's reconstructed out of living stone, not dead stone. For when the temple fell, it was made of simply living, but not life-giving stone. Now we are being turned into life-giving stone. And every stone must be fitted into that temple. And everyone will be called in order. Not one will be missing, may I tell you. Not one in eternity can fail to be called. And it goes through the same identical process. You are called, and then you are raised from within yourself. And it's not any outside Christ being raised. Christ is the eye of man. You are raised. You are awakened. And when you are awakened, you see no one but yourself. You are all alone. That's the Christ. In tune in your own power. And you and you alone come out by an innate wisdom as to how to do it. It's built in within you. For Christ is not only the power of God, he is the wisdom of God. So there's an innate wisdom how to do it. And you're exactly how to do it. And you push the base of your star. And something moves. And you come out. When you come out and I ask who did it, you say, ah, that's Christ. 
That is the Son of Man. That is the Son of God who can claim, I and my Father are one. In the world, yes, I seem to be less than my Father. For I am now doing a job. I am in the world as one that is sent. But the sender and the saint are one. I am only inferior to myself, the sender, when I am playing the part of the saint. But I will return to myself, the sender, and I will be one with myself, the sender. So I will leave the world and return to my father, and I and my father are one. But how to explain that to those who believe in a Christ on the outside? When throughout the centuries they have been taught to believe in some external Savior, and there is no external Savior. You and you alone decided to do what you did. We collectively decided to do it, to come into the world of death and die, literally die, and then be victorious and overcome death. That's who we are. And everyone, in spite of what he has done, what he is doing, or what he may do, he is that Christ spoken of of Scripture. And so, how to tell a man that although the imagery seems strange, it is actually true. You rise just like a fiery serpent. Who will believe that? Who will believe that the Mount of Olives is my own body? I stand on the Mount of Olives, and I face Jerusalem. And then it splits from top to bottom, as told in the great 13th of Mark and the 24th of Matthew, as the lightning comes from the east and shines towards the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man. It's a boat of lightning, and you get it, and you split yourself right down the middle, and the mountain part in two. So the Mount of Olives is now cut in two from east to west, and one half moves northward, and one half moves southward. And then out of Jerusalem, because you can view Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, comes living water. And I tell you, it is living water. It is golden, liquid, pulsing, living light. And as you look at it, you know it yourself. How can I, a man, know I am liquid, liquid light, but I am, and I fuse with it, and as I fuse with it, like a fiery serpent, right up into my skull. So as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, in the same manner. After the monk is split in two from top to bottom, now, when they're looking now, as they are, they go off to Jerusalem, physically. They have these enormous productions where foundations give them millions to excavate all kinds of things to try to find where he was buried. Where he was buried. The only place where Christ was ever buried is in the human skull. And it's called in Scripture, Golgotha. In the book of Luke, they actually call it by our name, Skull. And when they're brought into the place called Skull, there they're buried. In. Now, Golgotha means Skull, but it's the Hebrew form of Skull. We speak of Calvary. Well, Calvary is the Latin form of Skull. And so the whole thing is simply your own wonderful human Skull. That's where the whole drama takes place. It all takes place in the imagination of man. There is nothing but God, and God is the human imagination, and the drama of God is unfolding within us. So let no one tell you that they can see signs of the end of the world, the end of the age. But the end of the age is the end of the tribulation of human experience. That's the end. There is no other end. You and I have gone through hell. And when we come to the end of the tribulations of human experience, then suddenly, the shocking suddenness, the whole thing erupts within us. For your toes do not ask. It comes like a thief in the night. 
when you least expect it, he will come. Therefore be alert, but there shall be no sign. This generation seeks a sign, and there shall be no sign. I tell you, it will come just maybe tonight. I hope so. I know in my own case, I went to bed as innocent as I had in any previous day. I had a lovely day. I liked it to an audience of maybe 1,100, 1,200. I went out to brunch because I didn't have breakfast with two friends, husband and wife. We went to a simple little place and had what I would call breakfast. There, were, there was no liquor served, and I didn't feel like a drink at the time. I had a normal, simple breakfast, orange juice, bacon and eggs, and coffee. Then we went riding all through San Francisco. And that night, a friend of mine who worked as a checker in the Fairmont Hotel, who had to be up early in the morning to check in the waiters and check in the projects that they came through. So he had to be on the job, I think, between 4.30 and 5, to check in all the food coming in. And so we had a very early dinner, as early as the restaurant would allow. And we dined at the Sir Francis Break, where I was living. And here, we had a roast beef dinner, simple dinner, roast beef and a baked potato. I did have a couple of martinis. But may I tell you, that is only a beginning with me. I can go many. It doesn't save me at all. I can take five or six. It doesn't bother me. I had two martinis. That were simply wetting my little tongue. <laughs> then I went upstairs because he had to go early. And then about nine o'clock, I called my wife, who was living in Beverly Hills, and then put him on the wire because we're all friends. And then he said goodbye a little after nine, after he left. Then I undressed and got ready for bed, but it was too early. I read a little Blake, and then I turned to my Bible, and I must have turned in about eleven. And four in the morning, the strange, peculiar vibration in my head, something I never felt before. And my interpretation of what I felt was, this must be a massive hemorrhage. I never had anything wrong with me physically of that nature, but I thought this must be what they call a massive hemorrhage. This must be it. Because I couldn't see how I could survive what I'm feeling. My head began to vibrate, and the whole thing is simply like an enormous vibration. Instead of blowing my brain, I began to awake. But instead of awakening on the day, as I thought I would, I awoke within myself. And here I am completely entombed in myself. And I knew my skull to be a tomb. It was a sepulchre. And I'm completely entombed within it, all alone. And then from the horizontal position, I rose within my skull. And my one consuming urge was to get out. And I knew exactly what I ought to do to push the base of my skull from within. But may I tell you, all things being relative, when I awoke within my skull, it was a place big enough, say, well, a quarter of this room here. And it was my skull. And I stood up within my skull in a place, the area would be about a quarter of this room. I knew exactly where the base was, and I pushed it from the inside, and something rolled away from the outside, as you're told, and the stone rolled away. Then I knew what to do. I put my head through the little opening, and I pushed it. And then I squeezed myself out like a little child coming through the womb of a woman. Only instead of through the womb of a woman, this is out of my own tongue. And when I was almost out, I pulled the remaining portion of me out of my skull. Then I stood up and looked back at this out of which I came, and it was ghastly pale. I told us in Jeremiah, Can a man bear a child? The obvious answer is no. Why then do I see every man drawing himself out of himself just like a woman in labor? And why has every face turned ghastly pale. Well, the face was just as white as snow. As I came out of it, 
and then the entire drama unfolded around me. The witnesses to the event, and they could not see me because God was born that moment. The sign of my birth was there, the child they could see. And I saw the child and could take it in my arms, but they could not see me because God is spirit. I know mortal eye can see him. So they could not see the one that was born that moment. It is God in man that is buried. It is God in man, which is the I of man. The personal pronoun I. That's God in man. And that is born, it awakens in man and comes out. And the pattern by which he does it all is told us in scripture. And it's recorded as the story of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ refers to himself constantly as the Son of Man. Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And when they answered concerning men, he did not answer, he asked another question, but who do you say that I am? For he equates himself with the Son of Man. Then one answered and said, Thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you, but my Father who is in heaven, and I and my Father are one, so I revealed it to you. I allowed you to know who I am. That's what he said. That same drama takes place in you. So I am telling you, everyone in this world is going to awaken, not only as the Lord Jesus Christ, but as God himself, for the Lord Jesus Christ is God. That is the story of Scripture. But man has not understood it. And today, when you, like Monday morning paper, you will read all this palaver, all this nonsense concerning Scripture, concerning the signs that are coming because some rumor of war this goes on forever this is the conflict it is after the tribulation of human experience that it happens and if you could only now remember what you've gone through you've gone through hell you will have glimpses of it at the very end because then you can stand it but all the things you have suffered in this world the things you have gone through, it is good and merciful that you cannot remember them. In the end, you can take it, but you have to pass through all. As you are told in Scripture, I tried you in the furnaces of affliction. For my own sake, I did it. For my own sake. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. And glory is himself. He cannot give himself to another. He has to make you himself to give himself to you. Because there's only God. In the end, there is only God. Everything in the end is God. And there's nothing but God. So here, you are trained not to argue that when someone brings up all the stories concerning Scripture, you are trained to answer. And you can confront them, even though you have not had the complete experience, many of you have had many of these experiences. Not the complete, all right. You will have the complete. I am not alone. I am only at the moment one who has been sent to tell it. I have been sent to tell it. So that seventh chapter of Daniel, when the one like the Son of Man came before the Ancient of Days and was presented to him, that happened to me in 1929. I was taken in spirit into the Divine Assembly, and having gone before the recording angel, where my name was checked off, there was a huge letter, as told you in the twelfth chapter of Daniel. Here, if your name be written in the book, well, everyone's name is in that book. And she simply looked at me, this angelic being. Not one word was spoken between us. She just looked and just made a check against the name. 
that I was taken into the presence of the Ancient of Days. He is the Ancient of Days. Infinite love. Nothing but love. As I stood before him, you can't think of anything but love. And he asked me, what is the greatest thing in the world? And I answered, love. He had no other answer. How could you answer anything when you're actually looking at infinity of love? And it's man. Just man. <clears throat> then he embraced me. And that embrace refused, we became one body. And he who is united with the Lord becomes one spirit with him. One body, one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. Then he sent me. Sent me into this world. But he didn't send me as love. The one who sent me was himself because God is a protean being. He assumes every shape. And the one who sent me was infinite power. I could not feel in him compassion at all. I could not feel in that one love. But he sent me. And the words rang out in my ears, done with the blue blood. Doesn't mean those who call themselves prominent socially know. Or that trivia anyway. Done with all church protocol. All the trappings of the outside world mean nothing for me, nothing. All the ceremonies, all the rituals, all the things on the outside, done with it all. Don't tear it down, but do not become a part of it. Just completely ignore it. Well, I can tell you how many opportunities I have had from those who are entrenched in the protocol of churches to join them. I didn't have to go to any school. They said, I will now ordain you now. Then you can do all the things that we do by law. You can marry, you can bury, you can do all these things. I said, no, no part of it. These words ringing out in my ears, and I would simply disobey the order, down with the blue blood, which means church protocol, and accept the offer, one chat, he had an audience of over 6,000 people. That is, he had, they're all registered, all contributed every month, and he offered that entirely whole thing to me, if I would take it. I said, I'm sorry, I cannot take it. Give it to someone else, but I cannot take it. I have orders, I have orders that I must obey. And it came from the ancient of days. Well, he couldn't understand that. Ancient of days, these are just words to the average preacher, preacher. They mean nothing, they're simply idle words, and yet every word is true in Scripture. Her things, the ancient of days, no father, no mother, no beginning. The ancient of days, he has no origin, and you stand before him, and he actually embraces you, and you become one now, without father, because you are the father. And as father, you have no father. You are the father. Now go, and done with the blue blood. Done with all churchianity. All external things in this world. So no inducement whatsoever could get me to join any ism. Now at the end of my days, it doesn't really matter. At least I kept the faith. So I could say with Paul, I have finished the race. I have fought the good fight. And I've kept the faith. Now there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Which means the crown of faith. I've kept the faith. So when the little garment is taken off, now it is for the last time. So here I am just as an example for you because it's going to happen to you. Whether you now are Believing or not, it's still going to happen to you. Because not one can be missing in the reconstruction of the temple. You are the Son of Man spoken of in Scripture, which is the title most often used as Christ. It simply means I. The personal pronoun, I. All one. So when I am lifted up, that's the Son of Man. And as the Son of Man must be lifted up like the serpent, you can say, when I am lifted up like that fiery serpent, and you will. Just like it, it's a fiery serpent, and you enter violently into that 
skull of yours, and go riveted into that area prepared for you. Everyone has a special unique spot in the infinite brain of God. And you are not only that unique spot, you share the whole. Cut me hair, or right, that's cut and it hurts, but the whole body hurts. Don't tell me because the little finger is not my eye. The eye is in suffering too. The whole body suffers when one little piece suffers. So everyone is fitted into the restored temple. And yet each is the whole temple. For God is one. And his name is one. So everyone in this universe is going to experience scripture. And I can tell you the thrill in store for you when you experience scripture. Something changes. You see, we begin within history. That's the incarnation, when God becomes man. God became as I am, a man, weak and limited and restricted, that I may become as God is. So here we begin within history. Then comes that moment in time when we go beyond history. And that's called Bethlehem. We begin, the incarnation is the birth of a child. And the birth of God is called Bethlehem. Came from above, God awaits. And you are God. The I, may I tell you, there is no one else than you awake in that star. You are not in eternity going to see Christ coming from without. He is within, very within, and he rises from within as the eye of you. And how would you know what the imagery unfolds before you? All this pertains to Christ. There is a child wrapped in swaddling clothes. And what are they told? Go and you will find a child wrapped in swaddling clothes. This shall be a sign unto you. What sign? That God was born. This is a sign that the Savior was born, or the only Savior in the world is God. I am the Lord your God, your Savior, and beside me there is no Savior. The 43rd, 45th of Isaiah. If the Savior is born, then God is born. And this shall be a sign unto you that a Savior was born this day. Where? In Bethlehem. And Bethlehem and Jerusalem and Zion and the city of David are one and the same and it's the skull of man. That's where he was born and that's where he was crucified and that's where he was buried. It's right there. So I tell you, play your part fully. Whatever you're doing today, play fully. Let no one scare you. Self-purification, forget it. You can be as pure as all outdoors in your own mind's eye. It means nothing. This salvation comes suddenly, out of the north, just like a thief in the night. And when it comes, you're completely possessed. And then it unfolds within you. And all you can do is share it with others. Tell them about it. Well, they may deny it, as they will, because they know your physical background. They do not know your eternal being. So they know your father and mother, physically, your brothers and sisters, and they will ask the same question. Is he not Joseph's son, the carpenter's son? And how can he tell us now he came down from heaven? How can he tell us these things? That man is mad, and he has a spirit. I tell you, the same thing will happen to you. It doesn't mean that suddenly, in the world of Caesar, you're going to become a billionaire. You own the universe. <clears throat> what do you want with the billion when you own all thine are mine and mine are thine? You have no desire for the billion, <clears throat> or for glamour, or for recognition, none whatsoever. You're quite satisfied to go through life telling your story to those who will listen 
until that moment in time when you take off the cross. For this is the only cross that Christ wears, the human form. And you take it off for the last time and rejoin those who preceded you into heaven and rejoice with them. And then you will know what dominion really is. With the whole vast world, in time, you have the power to stop time, change motivation, and then start time. That's what I mean by dominion. To him was given dominion. You can actually stop it. And stopping time, everything stands still. Then you change the motivation of that which is now frozen in time. Then you release it within you, not on the outside. And they move forward, believing they initiated the change of heart to execute your commands.